Great. Okay. So the... <clears throat> hmm. All right, we got a little chopped off. So the context of this is um, in talking about yoga therapy, really the topic of mantra meditation in general is applicable to Ayurveda on many levels. And what I'd like to do is I would try, I'd like to try to um, cover that. And I'd like to try to cover it in some depth and to try to put everything in perspective related to mantra meditation. So on the first page, I've put the invocation. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This is a mantra, and we will talk about this. We'll talk about its meaning. It's actually a very good mantra. It is a Vishnu mantra, and um, it, it has meaning on many, many different levels. So, what is a mantra? Um, a mantra means something that delivers the mind. And there is a definition in Sanskrit for mantra. Manastrayate iti mantraha. That which delivers the mind is called mantra. We're going to go in depth on that a little bit later. Um, reading this definition, you know, you might think this is more applicable to a yogi or someone who's aspiring to become um, disentangled from life in the material world, but it's actually very relevant for um, people, normal people who have jobs and families and lives and are looking to have some peace and health and prosperity in their lives as well. Uh, the word mantra has become a part of the English language, but people often just take it to mean an assertion, and it may sometimes mean a relatively meaningless assertion. Um, so we're not really talking about mantra in that sense. We're, the meaning of mantra in yoga therapy and in Ayurveda is very, very deep. It has meaning on many different levels, and we're going to go into some of those. But in general, mantras are sacred vibrations, and they are invested with divine power, and they will reciprocate with us as we respect them. So one thing that I would like to try to get across is the way to think about a mantra, a mantra is not a thing. Think about a mantra as, let's say that, um, you know, you got the darshan, if you, you got audience with some divine personality who sort of stepped down out of the clouds, you know, a, a, a deva, an angel, a divine personality who's shining and brilliant and you know, it's simply the touch of their hand would heal all of your diseases and give you some uh, divine knowledge and wisdom. And you would just be absolutely stunned, speechless, seeing a personality like that. And then if they said, you know, I'm going to take my power, I'm going to take the things that I have to give you through my touch and my presence... I'm going to put that in a little package and I'm going to give that to you. And I would like you to respect that as you are respecting me right now. That is what a mantra is. A mantra has divine power in it. And if we respect mantras, then we actually can get the benefit from invoking them. So we really want to think of a mantra by this definition, a sacred vibration. It's 
full of divine power. And if we can respect mantras, the mantras will help us. They will, will take care of us. And this is a very important part of a mantra meditation. So let's talk a little bit about the philosophy. We don't want to do any, you know, headache inducing philosophical discourses. Although, you know, when uh, Monica said, could you do a class on mantra meditation? I said, oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. I could talk for hours about it. She said, no, please, let's not talk for hours about it. You're going to get everyone a headache. I said, okay, we'll try to, you know, make it relevant. But some of this is very important. So we talk about when we, if you remember, when we start talking about Sankhya philosophy, we start with this. Shakti Shakti Madur Abhedaha. This is from Vedanta Sutra. There is no difference between potency and the wielder of potency, between the Shakti Man, the, the divine who has all potencies and those potencies. This is a very important concept when we talk about mantras. Because mantras are invoking both the um, the controller of energy as well as the energy or potency that's there. And we're going to get into that as we talk about some of the specific mantras. So, and again, get back to Sankhya philosophy. We talk about how everything comes from Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha and prakriti are a transformation of the divine. The divine exists both in the form of shakti man, the controller and wielder of potency, and shakti or potency. And potency has a very broad scope. <coughs> if you recall, we've talked about potency, and it's not energy in terms of you know electricity and heat and the various types of energy that are described in physics, we're really talking about the potential for doing things, the potential for accomplishing, even the potency for fulfilling wishes. These are all types of potency. And these potencies are invested in various mantras. So here's a little diagram I had done uh, some time ago when I was trying to explain um, the concepts of Sankhya. You know, here you have in this little you know, radiant cloud here, this is the, it's the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is, is eternal. It doesn't decay. It doesn't go away. There's no death. There's no disease. There's no old age. There is not even a shred of ignorance. Just think about that for a moment. Think about a level of existence where there's no ignorance, where there is no lack of knowledge. Ignorance is compared to darkness, where there's the absence of light. We say darkness. Imagine a place where everything is luminous and effulgent, and there is no darkness. There's, there's no ignorance. That is the spiritual realm that we're talking about. And this is the place where Shakti Man, the supreme powerful, exists with Shakti or the supreme power in a supremely blissful union. And the aspects of the divine are Sat, all, all powerful, Chit, all cognizant, all knowing, and Ananda, all loving and all blissful. So from the spiritual realm, we, we have. Shakti Man manifests as the Purusha, the masculine principle, the controlling principle behind creation, and Prakriti, the fertile manifestation of the feminine principle. And then the Purusha and Prakriti join in the process of creation. And it's in this realm, uh, you know, like Madonna says, we're all living in the material world. Right. This is the mundane realm. It's temporary. It's changeable. It's subject to ignorance. And our happiness here is usually mixed with some pain. 
there's no unmixed happiness in this world. There's always going to be something, you know, even if it's the, the reminder that we all have to to die one day. There's no escaping some mixture of pain in this world. Okay, so this is just to put things in perspective. So again, last slide on philosophy, I promise. We talked about Sankhya, the ten matras, the objects of sense perception begin with sound. And if you think about accounts of creation, the accounts of creation begin with sound vibration, like Genesis in the in the Old Testament in the Bible. It says, "In the beginning, there was the word. There was what is the word? There was a vibration. There was a sound vibration." In the uh, Puranas, in these episodes, these accounts of creation, there is a thread of power that comes through sound. So sound vibration is the most subtle of all, and it can carry immense power. Like sometimes if we hear the sound of someone's voice, we may become inspired. I could read something and I might fall asleep, but if I hear the same person narrating it, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever heard Tony Robbins. I love Tony Robbins. He's a really great inspirational speaker he talks like this you know and he'll take some concept and he'll make it sound really exciting and he'll get you motivated you know it, it's that kind of thing there is a power in sound we know this on a practical level and on a deeper level on this spiritual level there is so much that can come through sound vibration sound can permeate all layers of existence, the layers of mind, the layer of intellect, the layer of ego, the layer of body. Mantras can also be uttered quietly. That is called japa, or they can also be said out loud, and that can be reciting them out loud. Like, you know, we, we said, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. We can also sing, you know, we can we can sing, and that is called kirtan. Um, sometimes we can sing and we can have, you know, musical accompaniment. And that's a very meditative thing. You know, sometimes we'll listen to a recording of someone reciting Vishnu Sahasranam. It is it is all mantras. It's like, you know, 20 minutes of solid mantra. Om Vishwam Vishnu Vashat Karo Bhuta Vya Bhavat Prabhu Bhuta Krit Bhuta Brit Bhava Bhutatma Bhuta Bhavanaha. It is all, it is 1000 names of Vishnu. Very amazing vibration, full of power and, um, the other thing which we're going to also talk about the relevance of mantras in ayurveda but but especially mantras which have names of god these are very powerful and they can destroy um the results of past bad karma we can by uttering just by uttering the name of Vishnu, we are destroying results of uh, previous wrongs that we may have committed. And these, as we have also learned, are the root of our, our suffering, our pain. We are experiencing various types of pain. We get happiness and we get some distress in this life. And these are all coming from things that we have done in, in the previous in, in previous lives. So there are all different kinds of ways that we can um, involve ourselves with mantras. So the concept of qualification and how mantras are given this is a very important thing in Indian culture. It's it's a very, it, it's something that people take very seriously. Um, 
in, in traditional practice, mantras are only given according to the qualification of the recipient. So someone, um, you know, may go to a guru and they may say, you know, I have heard that you can give me a mantra that will allow me by sound vibration to start fire. There's a there's a really interesting story, and this is not something from really ancient history. This is like from about five years ago. There was a very, very famous musician named Tan Sen, and he had the ability by singing, by evoking mood, by evoking raga. Classical Indian music is based on raga. It's based on evoking mood. It's not it's not like in, in musical notation where the notes are all given. There's a raga. There's a, there's a way that the notes can be used and the notes can change. And, um, you know, you can think of like in a key, you know, like in, 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 well, okay, jazz musicians were inspired by raga. People like, like Miles Davis, they studied classical Indian music to understand about improvisation and the way that you know different keys, but it's it's more than that. So this person, Tan Sen, he had such an art, he had such a skill that he could invoke, um, he could bring out heat by invoking a particular mood by the way he sung. He could make it rain, or he could make something burst into flame. And that was just by singing. That wasn't even by doing, you know, mantras or anything like that, but there are stories of you know people being able by mantra to start fire in old times traditionally when uh fire ceremonies were done the priests were supposed to start the fire by mantra by invoking the correct mantra with the correct pronunciation and with the correct invocation of potency they could make the fire come out of the wood. So I'm just digressing a little bit here. Someone goes to um, a guru and says, you know, I have heard that you can give me a mantra to start a fire. The guru is going to say, you you can stay here and you can, I will see whether you are qualified. Because if a mantra like that is given, and there are also stories of mantras that can invoke weapons. There are, if you read epics like Mahabharata, there are stories of, you know, mantras that are invoked along with shooting an arrow that invokes a very powerful effect. Some of these weapons that are described in these old literature, they they have effects like, like, uh, like a, targeted tactical nuclear weapon. Nobody is going to give that kind of knowledge um, unless someone is very, very highly qualified. So there's a very long tradition in India that, you know, if you go to a, a guru um, and say, can you give me a mantra? Then usually they'll ask first, well, what is your qualification? You know, what do you know? Do you understand the difference between matter and spirit? Do you understand the difference between the temporary and the eternal? Do you understand atma tattva? Who are you? Are you the soul or the body or the mind? You know, that's the kind of, uh, there's, there's, a lot of respect around mantras in the, the traditional Indian culture. So there are mantras that are meant for special purposes and have special powers. And a guru will sometimes test the disciples. Sometimes they may test over many years before giving a special mantra. Um, giving a mantra. So I have also received mantras from my guru. Um, and there's... There's a process for it, you know. Uh, after doing some sadhana over some years, then my guru said, I, I, I will give you mantras. So you should be bathed and wearing clean cloth 
and you should come early in the morning and sit in front of me. So, and then I sat and my guru carefully spoke the mantras to me and instructed me how I should utter those mantras and at what time of the day and that I should not give it to other persons. He gave me the example, um, camphor. So you're familiar with camphor. Camphor is very aromatic, but camphor is also, um, it, it's so aromatic that if you keep camphor out in the open, it will eventually evaporate. It'll become less. Camphor is a solid substance, but it will actually slowly evaporate over time. He said, you should not share these things because otherwise you should keep it in your heart closed like a jar of camphor. And if you open that jar of camphor, the camphor will evaporate. So some mantras are given and they're meant to be Kept. They're meant to be kept locked up in your heart and you meditate on them and you treat them like something very, very precious, which the mantra has something that it will reveal to you as you are dedicated to the mantra. So this concept, this concept of testing the disciple and having to jump through some hurdles, this is like the concept of yama and niyama in Ashtanga Yoga. In Ashtanga Yoga, you start with yama and niyama. You start with, I'm going to give up some things which are bad for my yoga practice, and I'm going to dedicate myself to regularly doing things and practicing my yoga sadhana. Very, very important. So what are some of these different types of mantras? So the, we mentioned mantras that can be given a specific invocation and purpose. There are mantras for healing. There are mantras, uh, you know, even for invoking weapons. There are mantras that can start fires. But there are also divine mantras. And these can be used very often and used with respect to get divine blessings. So blessings are very, very important. We start a journey. We will invoke some mantras for, for blessings. We may even sometimes say, Mangalam Bhavatu, let there be auspiciousness. Kalyanam Bhavatu. We are asking this, let there be well-being, let there be auspiciousness, let good things come of this. Um, there is a, a very famous uh, mantra which is used in India, and it's very well known because everyone who's ever seen a Hindi movie with the wedding has probably heard this. Um, Mangalam Bhagavan Vishnu Mangalam Garudadvajaha Mangalam Vodhika let Bhagavan Vishnu do auspiciousness unto you. Let Bhagavan Vishnu with lotus-like eyes do auspiciousness. Let Bhagavan Vishnu who rides on the back of Garuda do auspiciousness. And let Hari Vishnu who takes away all auspicious things do auspiciousness to you. So blessings are very important and we can invoke blessings. We, we cannot invoke blessings too much, really. So this type of mantra is really what we're going to talk about. Um, but still, even when we are invoking these mantras for blessings and for divine divine invocation of blessing, we should give them respect. We should treat them as divine personalities, and they will reciprocate us more. Again, the way to think of mantra is, you know, I have gone outside, and I've come in this beautiful garden, and some divine being, some divine being or goddess has come down, and they are shining and effulgent, and 
incredibly beautiful and they impart knowledge to us just by the touch and healing and and uh, auspicious fragrance and light and life and pran flows through us and they give us something and this is a mantra and say i have put myself in this mantra so please treat me with respect and i will give you blessings again and again and again this is the proper way to think of mantras so names of the divine both shakti and shakti man these are all mantras in and of themselves the names are not made up names they're not imaginary they are given and they are invested already invested with potency they're already charged with potency so i also wanted to tell a story about someone who achieved perfection through mantra there was a boy named dhruva he was only six years old and he was the son of a king who had two wives he was the son of the wife who wasn't the favorite. And the wife who was the favorite spoke very harshly to him. He wanted to sit on his dad's lap. And the wife said, oh, you are not my son. So, you know, you, you, uh, you, you are the second rate, you know. And he was so hurt by that. He was so hurt. He ran to his, his mom. Um, and he said, oh, oh, how can she say that? And she said, well, you know, it is true. I, I'm not the favorite. And, and so, and he said, no, this will not be, I, I cannot have it. And so he was a very royal kid and he went off to the forest. He said, I will do tapasya. I will do austerity. And so that I will have a kingdom even greater than my father. And he was met by Narad Muni. And Narad Muni said, oh, you, you're just a little boy. Why are you out here in the forest? You should go home to your mom. He said, no, Dhruva said. Uh, the name Dhruva in Sanskrit actually means certainty. Dhruva said, I must be successful. So Narad Muni said, okay, I will give you a mantra. You do this mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And he gave him instructions how to recite this mantra and what to do. And so Dhruva practiced mantra along with yoga practice. And he did it so diligently that he achieved perfection within six months. And he had darshan of Bhagavan Vishnu. So Dhruva fixed his mind in meditation on Bhagavan Vishnu through this mantra. So it is, there's a very interesting part of this story, which is that Dhruva was so fixed. <coughs> his meditation on Vishnu was so complete and so perfect because Vishnu is the sustainer of the whole universe. And he is actually sustaining everything. But because Dhruva had his mind so perfectly meshed in meditation on Vishnu through this mantra, that the weight of Bhagavan Vishnu was pushing down on Dhruva. He was standing on one leg and his toe was pressing down on the earth so that it was pushing the whole pran of the universe out of circulation. You know, we talk about pran and the circulation of pran in the body, microcosm and macrocosm. There's also circulation of pran in the universe. There's flow of vital energy in the universe. And Dhruva was so intensely absorbed in meditation that the master of the universe was actually lent, giving his weight on Dhruva. And then he came in front of Dhruva and said, 
okay, I am here. <laughs> now you can ask anything you want from me. And Dhruva said, oh, now I have had your darshan. Think about that divine personality who comes in front of you and takes away your breath and leaves you speechless and stunned. And Dhruva said, I have seen you. You are very hard to see, even for great sages who perform great austerities. And seeing you, I don't have any other desire left to fulfill. I don't want anything from you because I have had your darshan. I have had your divine audience. And I am completely fulfilled and satisfied. But Bhagavan Vishnu said to Dhruva, he said, oh, you know, if I don't give you something, people will say, oh, look at the Dhruva. Dhruva, he did this tapasya, and Bhagavan Vishnu came, and he didn't get anything except he got to see Bhagavan Vishnu. So you have to accept it anyway. So he gave Dhruva, I said, I will make a planet for you, which is called Dhruva Loka, which we call the pole star. That is called in Sanskrit Dhruvalok. And it is a, a planet that, that does not become destroyed even at the time the universe is destroyed. So it is a very nice story, but it is illustrative of uh, this is how someone has achieved perfection through mantra meditation. So mantra, basically, you know, think of mantra as as being full of divine power. So, there is a sacred syllable, Om. So there is an etymology of Om. It goes like this. Akare no chate krishna ha sarvaloka ikanaya kaha ukare no chate radha makaro jiva vacha kaha So there are three syllables. A, U, um, together becomes Om. So this A uh is taken to re represent Krishna, Shaktiman, the supreme master of all worlds. U uh represents Radha, Shakti, the divine feminine potency. And Ma is the individual A, uh, that's us, all joined together in service. So Om signifies the divine both in the form of Shakti and Shakti Man joined together with the pure soul or Atma. So this Om, this is a mantra in and of itself. It's also a seed invocation for other mantras. Om is given so much respect that even in some places, they will not utter Om. A guru will not utter Om in front of persons who may not be fully qualified. Om is even considered to be a mantra that um, one should not even try to utter it without being qualified. It is given such respect. So Om is a sacred syllable, and it is in and of itself. One can meditate on Om. Think on Om as a sound vibration, which is a manifestation of the full divine, both Shakti and Shaktiman. Om. So Om is by itself a manifestation of the divine in sound. So Om is also used as a seed invocation for other mantras. A seed invocation is also called Bij. A Bij means that part of the mantra, which is like the, the, the little kernel around which everything else is wrapped. It, it's, it's a very important part of the mantra. So for example, in the mantra, 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम इज द बीज ऑफ दिस मंत्र एंड इट स्पेसिफिकली सिग्निफाइज भगवान विष्णु लेट अस टॉक अबाउट दिस मंत्र नाउ ओम नमः नमः मींस I offer my respect. Namaha also means not selfish. I am bowing down. I am putting my head down. I am submitting. I am not being proud and selfish and arrogant, but I am submitting myself before you. you are full of divine power and potency and i am actually relatively helpless so please you help me i am not able to do things on my own so please help me this is namaha bhagavati means unto bhagavan bhagavan means the supreme personality who is full in six opulences who has all power who has all wealth who has all fame who has all knowledge and wisdom who has all beauty and who has all detachment or renunciation Vasudevaya Vasudev is a name for the supreme divine which means that he is realized in the most pure state of existence that is a state called the Vasudev state and Vasudev means one who is understood only when some one's mind their heart is completely pure so you know we, we talk about the three gunas sat rajas and tamas sattva gun is the relative absence of rajas and tamas it is the mode of purity the mode of goodness but it's not completely pure when we have a completely pure absolutely unadulterated sattva gun that is called vishuddha sattva or vasudev so om namo bhagavate vasudevaya this is a, it's a very deep mantra we have also put it on the logo of our um, ayurveda wellness institute So what about sharing mantras? So you know it's it's a thing that we do we we go to a yoga class and we take part in some mantra Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namah shivaya Om gam ganeshaya namaha or some mantra and then we want to share it with people you know so what about sharing mantras it's a natural thing if i experience something that's really good i'd like to share it with others but we should not share mantras with persons who have no respect for them this would be disrespectful this is called aparad and if we do aparad to mantras then they may stop helping us so we can share mantras that invoke divine blessings with some one who's ready to respect them so you know we we we've, we've talked about mantras which are names of the divine which are names which invoke divine blessings these are mantras which can just be shared very readily but we should not just you know go telling people about them if they, if they don't have any respect for them vishnu mantras in particular never have ill effect and these are very good to share i'll tell you another story um so there are mantras are the divine is manifest both as vishnu as the maintainer of the universe and also as shiva shankara who is the manifestation of the divine 
in contact with the material world. So he's all powerful. He's not in the same category as ordinary beings or angels or devas. He is in his own unique category. But sometimes invoking the blessings of Shri Shiva can be a little dangerous. There is a difference between a Vishnu and Shiva. Vishnu will never give blessings that can have an adverse effect, whereas Shiva, Shri Shiva, he may sometimes give blessings according to what someone has asked for, um, even if they may have a harmful effect. And there's a very interesting and uh, hopefully you'll find an amusing story. There was a uh, an asura. Uh, asura means a person who is, you know, uh, is kind of a materialistic, selfish, um, uh, ungodly person. And he wanted to have some power. So he thought, I will invoke the blessings of Shri Shiva so that I can have blessings, so that I can have some power. So what did he do? He um, he only ate ashes. So you might wonder about that. How is it possible to just eat ashes? Well, it would be very, very dry and very astringent. And it's, it's uh, very extreme. And he was eating ashes and somehow remaining alive. And um, he wanted to get a blessing from Shivaji. So Shri Shiva appeared before him. And he said, oh, he said, Basmasura, I have come. You have called me. I am ready to give you a blessing. So this person, he was an Asura. He was, um, you know, materialistic and uh, kind of a vicious person. He said, oh, I want a blessing that if I touch someone, their head will crack and they will die. What a horrible thing to ask. But Sri Shiva said, okay, you can have that blessing. Because he will give someone basically whatever they ask. So, of course, Basmasura, he looked at Shiva and he saw Shiva there with Parvati. And Parvati is such a beautiful goddess. And he was thinking, oh, I can kill Shiva now with the blessing he has given me. And I will take Parvati for myself. So it was a, you know, he wanted this horrible blessing. And then he wanted to do something horrible with it. So he started coming towards Sri Shiva and Sh Shankarji. Sri Shiva, he saw him and he said, okay, this is what's going on. This guy now has taken this boon from me and he wants to turn it against me. So he began to run and that person was chasing after him. So Shivaji went to Bhagavan Vishnu and he said, please, can you help me? And Vishnu said, okay, no problem. I will help you. So Vishnu, he changed himself into a disguise. He disguised himself as a young boy. And this Basmasura came running and Vishnu said, hey, where are you going in such a hurry? And he said, oh, I have gotten a boon from uh, Shivaji that I can... Um, touch anyone's head and it will crack open. They will die. I am now going to conquer Shivaji. Vishnu said, oh, <laughs> you've really been duped, haven't you? You know, this Shiva, he's really not in his right mind. He is this guy who wears a garland of skulls around his neck and he smears his body with ashes. And he hangs out in the crematorium. 
you know, he just hasn't really been right in his head for quite some time. I'll tell you something. You know, I think he's really pulled a fast one on you. I'm telling you, whatever he's told you, uh, but you, know, you don't have to, look. You don't have to take my word for it. Just you know, you can try it out on yourself. Touch your own head. See, nothing's going to happen. So he was bewildered by Vishnu's words. He touched his head, and immediately he died, and the problem was solved. So the point is that uh, Bhagavan Vishnu does not give someone a blessing that they will that will be harmful. He will never give a, a harmful blessing. Um, and so um, usually th those who invoke Vishnu mantras, they will do it for blessings and, and when we want no bad effect to come. But it is always done with respect. So if we have Vishnu mantras, you know, like Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, it can never have an ill effect. And with respect, if we want to share these kind of mantras, that's fine. So some mantras. Here are some mantras. So I've given a few here. So there's this one. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This is a Vishnu mantra, as we've already described. Another one. Shri Ramayana. Rama is a name of the divine, which means the unlimited reservoir of all pleasure. Ramante yogino nante satyananda chidatmani iti rama padena saoparam brahma bidhiyate. The supreme Brahman is called Rama because yogis derive unlimited limited bliss and pleasure from him so shri ramaya namaha shri means shakti so in the mantra we always invoke shakti and shakti man shakti why shakti because shakti is the feminine aspect of the, the divine so if we approach the divine as a masculine personality you know, um, it's. I find it very interesting. I, I love to look at comparative religion. It, it's always fascinated me, you know, because I, I've had a very interesting journey in my life. And I've always tried to see things from different perspectives. But, you know, when I was growing up and I would read, I was raised with ideas from um, from Christianity and it always seemed like God was a little angry and you know a bit like like the you know the the dad who got really mad and well where's the mom who would you know come and give you a hug and but actually that is there it's there usually in the form of the you know uh, Ave Maria Grazia Plena the the you know, invocation of the feminine divine is there in a form, but more in Catholicism. Um, I didn't really know that at the time. I didn't really understand that. But, you know, if you think about it, it's that when we approach the divine as both masculine and feminine, it's the feminine aspect that is softer, that's more full of grace, more willing to be compassionate to us. So in these mantras, the the feminine divine is also there. So Shri Ramaya Namaha. Shri Rama is Sita and Ram together. So not just Ram, who is the supreme uh, Purush, uh, masculine person, but also Shri, his feminine aspect the feminine side who who will be more compassionate because we want the blessings we want the compassion another mantra this mantra is called the maha mantra it is called the great mantra for blessing and deliverance hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare hare 
Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. This is from the uh, Kalisantarana Upanishad. It is said to be the best mantra to counteract all the ill effects of this age of Kali. And it's a very nice mantra. We can recite it quietly. We can sing it out loud. We, we can say it out loud. Hare is the divine energy. It means the Shakti, Hara. Um, and Krishna is the supreme person who is all attractive. And Rama is the supreme reservoir of pleasure. So it is basically calling out to the divine, both as Shakti and Shaktiman. Very powerful mantra. And if we can say this with respect and with love or sing it, this will have a very amazing beneficial effect for us. Om Vishnave Namaha. I give my respect to Vishnu. Vishnu means the supreme divine who pervades every aspect of this world, who is present everywhere and at the same time is all present within my heart. Um, Om Vishnave Namaha. This is a very good mantra. Om Namaha Shivaya. So, so Shiva is the divine who is manifest as the supreme person in the material world. So, and Shiva means all auspicious. Om Parvatyaya Namaha. This is giving respect to Parvati, the supreme goddess in the material world. Om Surya Namaha. This is a mantra for invoking Surya Dev, the predominating deity of the sun, who is directly a manifestation of the divine. And Om Ganeshaya Namaha. This is giving respect to Ganesh, who is the destroyer of obstacles and who also helps all those who are on the path of study being um, Jyotish astrology and those who are in Ayurveda. In Ayurveda, we also give pranams to uh, Dhanvantari, who is a manifestation of Bhagavan Vishnu, as well as to Ganeshji. So Ganeshji <clears throat> helps remove obstacles and helps those who are studying any divine science um, and spiritual practice. So these are some mantras. So there are also application of mantras in astrological remedies. So sometimes, you know, we look at people's chart, we look at based on their time, date, and place of birth, and, you know, we look at what's going on. Sometimes it's evident that there's a particular problem, and sometimes there's a planet that is debilitated or that has got bad aspects, and mantras may help to invoke divine help. Sometimes the mantra will be, um, uh, you know, for example, if there is a problem with Saturn, we may invoke a mantra for Kurma, who is one of the 10 avatars of Bhagavan Vishnu. So we might recommend someone to use the mantra, Om Kurma Devaya Namaha. And we may say, you, you know, say this 108 times in the morning and, uh, you know, give some charity and this will help for counteracting bad effects of Saturn. Yantras or diagrams may also be inscribed. In, in our logo, we also have a Vishnu Yantra with the, the mantra Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So Yantras, diagrams may also be inscribed with mantras, and this may be done to invoke blessings or to help with overcoming obstacles. Mantras in Ayurveda. So 
herbs are associated with divine beings who bless them with special properties. So the, the traditional preparation of Ayurvedic remedies involves invoking mantras. This helps to activate essential properties and request blessings to help in healing. So the science of preparing different types of herbal treatments in Ayurveda, a lot of this has been lost. There's a lot of lost knowledge, very unfortunately. But still, if we're preparing something, if we are preparing anything, like even when we we make we make shiro dara pots, so we also invoke them with mantras and with blessings that they should have healing power as they're being created. Um, I just make them here in my little machine shop, and you know, while making them, there's mantra, there's meditation, and there's invocation of blessing, and you can do that even if you don't know specific mantras. Just some mantra, give some Vishnu mantra while you're preparing, while you're mixing things together, and give that intention of invoking blessing and healing. This is a part of Ayurveda. It's a very important part of Ayurveda. Um, you can even, there have been stories, there are sages, even uh, the uh, my guru, of Jyotish, Swami Raj Baldev. He is actually a great healer. What he will do is he will take water and he will add a little bit of saffron to it and he will offer it to Bhagavan Vishnu and he will invoke mantras. And if he gives you that water to drink, it can cure all kinds of sickness. So this is this is the power of mantra. Mantras can give such a, a healing power and invoke blessings. Another very important area in Ayurveda is the mind. Mantras can be most useful in disturbances that affect the mind. Why? The mind is most subtle. The mind is easily influenced by external environment, and the mind can also get the most benefit from mantra. So remember, we talked about mantra means uh, uh, that which delivers the mind. This is what we're talking about. The mantra can help the mind can help. When the mind is disturbed, we sometimes do things that are not healthy or not beneficial. So this is what we're talking about. So according to yoga philosophy, mind is the cause of our entanglement in worldly affairs and the suffering that results. And mind is also considered to be the cause of liberation when we can fix the mind on the divine through yoga practice. What does this mean in practical terms? So, okay, if someone's a yogi living in a cave in the Himalayas, that's very good. They can say that, you know, I'm going to free the mind from desires and the process of desiring things. But, um, you know, I'm, I've, I've got to live here. I'm living in the material world, and how do I manage this? But there are some so many of the problems that we are afflicted with, they can be traced to the mind. It's because of these three vrittis of the mind, thinking, feeling, and willing. We get enmeshed in a cycle of desiring and acting. We've talked about this. We've talked about this in the Manasa 101. We've talked about this in Sankhya. This is a natural, it, it's something that happens. But mantras have a cleansing of, and they, it, they can help to free us from being bound to chasing our own desires. How many times have you stopped yourself and turned around and said, you know, I just spent a lot of time and effort trying to, to chase down desires and do things that really, when I stopped and looked at it objectively, they didn't bring me happiness. Have we experienced that? 
and we sometimes look back and we say that I have now experienced some happiness from within. I didn't have to pay anything for it. I didn't have to go get some material thing. So this is one of the big problems in modern society is people think that things will make them happy. This is actually a disease of the mind. And if we can free the mind from such concepts, from these ideas, like thinking that, you know, things will make me happy, um, this is very beneficial. So when we're absorbed in chasing fulfillment of desires, we sometimes make choices which are not healthy, or we forget about the good choices we should make. You can pretty much just go down the list of every person you've talked to who's had a health problem, and you can trace it back to something that involves the mind. There's a very interesting um, thing. I was just reading something about the, the guy who wrote the Peter Pan books. The, uh, what was his name? Barry, I think. A very interesting study in consciousness. Apparently, he had a younger brother who had died very early, and his mother was so aggrieved that um, that Mr. Barry, while he, he was a boy, he started practicing being his younger brother and even using his younger brother's voice. And he actually didn't grow up. Uh, you know, he, his voice remained high even when he was 20. Uh, he remained very small. Uh, a very, very interesting study of the effect of consciousness. So this is also, um, you know, it's illustrative of the way that the mind can tend to shape the way the body develops. So what are some useful daily practices? When we meditate, we can do some quiet utterance of a mantra in which you have very strong faith and focus on the sound vibration. So, you know, let's say that I'm I'm saying a mantra like, like this. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Try to pronounce it correctly. You know, we've got some guides to the Sanskrit pronunciation and think about the sound vibration. Focus on the sound vibration. Make your mind and body like a tuning fork. Let it vibrate. You know, you know how a tuning fork works. If I have a tuning fork, I strike the tuning fork, and it's going to vibrate uh, at you know 440 cycles per second. Then that's going to be the A below middle C in music, right? But if I have that exact note vibrating, that tuning fork is going to start vibrating itself. So I want to make my mind and body into a tuning fork for the vibration of the mantra. I want to allow myself to be vibrated by this mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So you can practice the mantra and practice the vibration and try to tune yourself vibration. Do this with dedication, even if you for a few minutes daily. And if you have the opportunity, you can do kirtan. You can say some mantra. You can sing it. You know, maybe I'm driving and I, I can put on a recording. There are a lot of really nice recordings. There are people like Krishna Das and all kinds of people that have done really nice recordings and they're singing mantras and divine chants that are full of divine names and we can sing along with it. And this is very beneficial for us. We can also do some kirtan. Is when we do 
sing, singing or chanting in a group, when there's a number of people and they're all singing together, it has an even better effect, especially if the intention is very good. So there are different places that we can go. There are, um, you know, get-togethers where people have kirtan and there are temples where, where you know people do kirtan regularly and you know that's that's a very good thing to do if you can do that regularly okay so the last, the last slide didn't didn't come out but that's it so any questions um at this point I went just a little faster than I had meant to, but um, I think that's quite a lot of material to digest. So, um, you know, think about this, meditate on it. Um, you know, take a mantra and, and, and try to fully embrace that mantra with respect and love, you know. Think of the mantra as if, you know, you have had the darshan or audience of a divine personality who stepped down from a higher plane of existence and is just offering you abundant blessings. And every time you prepare to utter that mantra, just think of it that way. I'm welcoming blessings of this divine person who's just sort of, you know, stepped in front of my door and ready to give me blessings. And I'm putting my hands together and I'm giving them respect and I'm opening my heart and I am saying with respect the invocation that blessings may come. So... Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. This is a Vedic blessing. It is a Vedic invocation. You can do that um, after doing a session of mantras. Um, it is often done on completion of recitation of something. Um, and it is it basically an invocation of auspiciousness. Let there be peace within the universe. Let there be peace, let there be peace. So Om Shanti Shanti.